We now move to questions to the Minister of Education. I call Mr Justin McNulty. Mr McNulty. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question number one. Mr Speaker, I thank the member for his question. Uh, schools maintenance is an area of budget that is always under pressure, I think, due to the ageing schools and state. I suppose as part of that is, is why uh, there needs to be a, an overall sort of assessment of schools and state. While there is a significant capital programme underway involving new bills, school enhancement projects and minor works is also a significant number of schools requiring maintenance, which is funded from the resource budget. The budget for schools maintenance is just one of the budgetary pressures faced by the Education Authority. And the, uh, the budget position for education as a whole remains challenging. Now, as in the previous year, there was an initial £14 million pounds which allocated for maintenance for the 2016-17 uh, financial year. And, and I note the member has asked the question in terms of the budgets for this year, so I'm not quite sure if he's referring to the remainder of 16-17, to which was about three months, or whether he's looking ahead, perhaps, to um, beyond that. But the £14 million was allocated for maintenance uh, to enable the EA to undertake statutory and emergency responses, response maintenance and address urgent health and safety issues. There was, in the October monitoring round, an additional £950,000 uh, was allocated to the EA following that, so it's boosted up to approximately £15 million. Uh, and I'll continue to highlight uh, pressures in the maintenance budgets and monitoring rounds, uh, but obviously then there'll be the question of where we are uh, potentially for next year, and obviously that the focus is still very much on urgent uh, given the constraints of the budget, maintenance activities to address health and safety issues. Mr McNulty, for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Can the Minister tell me if there is a backlog in the maintenance, and if so, how much, and, how, and has, has he bid for additional resources in the monitoring rounds to clear that backlog? Well, in terms of the backlog, I mean, again, some of these things depend on where you draw the line on things. And so, one description for instance, of a maintenance backlog for the school estate could be estimated at just under £300 million, which I'm sure the member will realise is a little bit beyond the scope of a, of a monitoring round. Now, when we're talking about the definition of a maintenance backlog, that is to make, uh, to make good costs necessary to bring school back buildings back to the condition they were when they were built. So, you know, you're talking about, in many cases, a, a degree of transformation. And indeed, I think the argument would be if, that in many buildings, if you're trying to restore them to the position they were in where they were in day one, the level of expenditure that would be required for those buildings uh, would be such that it would be sort of prohibitive, and in many cases, either an SEP, a new school build, or indeed even minor works would actually be a much more cost-effective solution. So obviously those are outside the remits directly of, of the maintenance uh, budget. But obviously it's something that will be um, kept under review. Uh, to be perfectly honest on it, I suspect the feeling is that there's unlikely to be, considering where we are in terms of the overall budget position at present with the executive, uh, is there likely to be a great deal of money available in the next monitoring round? I think it's highly unlikely, but we'll continue to have discussions in relation to that. Call Mrs. Joanne Dobson. Mr Speaker, the Minister has recently sent a letter to schools requesting responses on how they can have better control of their own budgets. Can the Minister detail then at this stage whether he has any plans or proposals to put to schools, and if not, are they at least in development? I think from that point of view, the, the, the point in relation to that was to have something that was relatively open-ended, because there is no point in saying to schools, be it either governors, be it school principals, uh, from the point of view of autonomy, um, from the point of view of autonomy, what autonomy do you want, and then we'll tell you actually what the autonomy you're getting as part of that. So that is a degree of open-ended uh, situation. It is clear that, for instance, there has been an issue raised uh, around issues around maintenance, around procurement. There has been something that has been regularly raised, uh, you know, with me as I've been out around schools, and indeed before I became minister. And I think that is a very pertinent issue. It would be an area that, that I would probably intend to, to look at particularly closely if we're looking at autonomy, but autonomy and indeed the burdens that will be there would go wider than that. Because it has been, I know there may be a slight element of uh, at times urban myth with some of this stuff as well, but you know, I will get a response back sometimes from various school principals, a degree of frustration for instance in terms of procurement and some of the uh, blockages that are within that and a feeling that, um, and while one wants to have a, ensure that we have a, an open and transparent process, that we don't have a situation where 
potentially in terms of getting something relatively minor done in terms of maintenance, that it takes twice the length of time, possibly at a greater cost, than could be done if, it, if there was that level of autonomy locally. So I think from that point of view, whereas no decisions have been taken in terms of additional levels of autonomy from schools, I think that would be a very live area within that. But I would hope that whenever we look at issues of autonomy, uh, because I think there is an expertise that is down on the ground, particularly from school principals, um, that that is just one of the aspects that, that are, are looked at. But I don't come with a, a prejudged opinion in that regard, uh, and that's why I'm seeking directly the information from schools themselves. Call Lord Morrow. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, my question is not dissimilar from what Ms. Dobson has asked, but does the Minister accept that there is merit in looking and considering delegating funding to schools for their own maintained uh, projects? Surely there is some merit in this, and Minister, would you be prepared to consider that in the future? Certainly, I thank the member for his question. I certainly would be concerned to, to consider that. I mean, it is part of the wider consultation, probably effectively a pre-consultation, on greater autonomy. I think there is a, a feeling that in terms of what is known on the ground, that there are a range of issues, and maintenance is one very obvious example, where a school or a school principal knows the best way to do things, there should be a degree of autonomy sometimes as what they prioritise uh, within that. Um, now, obviously, balance against that, you've got to have, there are sometimes sensible autonomies, sorry, economies of scale. So you've got to balance that out to try to make sure that you also get the best possible value for money. But I think particularly if you're looking at issues around um, public procurement and around the, what is effectively, what, because what is done directly in schools tends to be lower level maintenance. I think there is a very good argument that a lot of that can be done with a delegated budget directly to, to schools. Nobody is talking about giving schools simply the money to build a new school or an SEP or anything of that nature. But if we're talking about day-to-day -day maintenance, then I think there is, there is good sense in, in looking at that closely. Mr Stewart Dixon. Thank you, Minister, for the answers to your question. Minister, just continuing on the theme of a certain level of autonomy for schools to carry out maintenance, is the reality that um, there is no point in having autonomy if they don't have the budget and the resource to do that? And is this not, in reality, adding an additional burden to already overburdened school principals who will now have to go out and procure uh, small works done in their schools? And is, this, is this not, and should this not be, the work of the Central Education Authority? Well, from that point of view, I've indicated that obviously these are issues for consideration, so it's not there's a done deal. What I would say is, I mean, it's about trying to work out where the, the dividing lines should be. I think it's also the case that I mentioned earlier about the 14 million, for example. If there was movement towards uh, that low-level maintenance being dealt with at schools level, it would be the budget would have to follow the function. There's no point in doing so otherwise. Can I also say the other side of the coin in terms of what was being looked at? and um, I th again, I think there's compelling cases in relation to that, is also, whereas if there's clearly going to be a greater level of autonomy, a greater level of responsibility, yes, that does create a certain level of, of burden. Um, having said that, I think we also need to be looked, which was the other part of the consultation as well, at what levels of unnecessary bureaucratic burden do we place on schools? Now, sometimes you will get a reaction from schools who will say, we don't really want this, why on earth are they asking for that? And it may well be, to be fair, depending upon what the nature of things, there may be very good reasons why either the education authority or the department, or indeed an external body, seeks that particular piece of information. But I'm also concerned that we don't get a situation where there's simply a level of, of duplication. And when issues have been raised sometimes between schools, it has been about the, uh, the weight of paper load that is, that is there. Uh, and consequently, if we can create a situation in which there is sensible removal where we can within that. I think that in many ways that goes to the other side of the coin to looking at greater levels of autonomy. But obviously, as with anything in life, if you're taking greater decisions, that there will be greater level of responsibility um, on you as well. Members, before I call Mr Christopher Stalford, I have to inform the House that question four has been withdrawn. Mr Stalford. Question number two, Mr Speaker. Right, I thank the member for his question. Obviously, Directly speaking, the department is not uh, the uh, employer of teachers, um, and therefore it's not responsible directly for the appointment of teachers. Teachers individually within a school setting are uh, employed by each board of governors. With the recruitment, selection and appointment process of teachers carried out, I think in conjunction with the employing authority, um, for example, if it's uh, such as the education authority, 
uh, or the Council for Catholic Maintained Schools, or in the case of a voluntary grammar uh, or grant maintained integrated schools by the individual Board of Governors. So I acknowledge in the, the current economic climate it can be difficult for many teachers to find employment in schools. The same could be said of graduates in a wide range of professions. Uh, my department and the employing authorities have put in place a number of policies and practices which encourage the employment of newly or recently qualified teachers when filling vacancies. And it includes recommending that employers should consider the newly qualified teachers or experienced non-retired teachers seeking to return to employment when filling vacancies, including those of a temporary nature, and also uh, the Investing in Teacher Workforce Scheme, uh, which passed through the, the executive uh, during the summer and was then formally launched on the 5th of September. Uh, and the primary aim of that scheme is to refresh the teaching workforce uh, whilst providing job opportunities for those recently qualified teachers who have experienced the greatest difficulty in securing meaningful employment. Mr. Stalford, for supplementary. Thank you, sir. Uh, can I ask the, the minister? He mentioned uh, in his answer the investing in the teaching workforce scheme. Could the minister detail for the House the range of impacts that he expects that scheme to have uh, and the sorts of targets that have been set in terms of trying to increase opportunities within the profession? Okay, well, as indicated, I think the, the scheme itself was launched on the 5th of September. It was for 2016 17 a pilot scheme. Uh, members may well remember from the previous mandate uh, that there was at one stage a scheme that was mooted uh, for a larger number all to be there in one year. I think the feeling was that, um, irrespective of the, the merits of that, that that something wasn't, in terms of numbers, going to be achievable within one year. So uh, the primary aim of the scheme, as indicated, is to refresh and reprofile the teaching workforce whilst providing job opportunities for those teachers who have experienced the greatest difficulties in securing meaningful employment. And it is clear that um, and perhaps not, um, uh, not unreasonably, the figures, if you like, for those who are most recently qualified will have a higher unemployment rate in terms of permanent uh, employment than those who have been out for some time. So the scheme in terms of what the target figure uh, was bid, I think, for about £8 million pounds from the, uh, the Public Sector Transformation Fund um, to enable um, 120 teachers aged 55 and over to avail of that. Um, the figure itself that was what was projected in relation to that um, and the aim would be therefore that it wouldn't simply just be that they would get that opportunity for early retirement and it obviously would have to be something that would be driven by an application from the, the teacher themselves but also that, that the condition if you like of, of accessing that fund would be that job opportunities um, would be provided for a corresponding number of recently qualified teachers who qualified from the years 20, uh, 2012 up to and including 2016. Now, it is hoped that that process is in place. It is hoped that those posts will then be advertised um, in spring of 2016. And I have to say, without that scheme, those opportunities simply wouldn't uh, exist. Um, so that will see, I think, uh, teachers released, being secured for release by March the 31st, 2017. Call Ms. Sinead Bradley. Um, does the Minister accept that there are many young, vibrant, very good, well-qualified teachers who are excluded from the investing in the teacher workforce scheme? And would he consider lifting the maximum age, or the well, age, but the profile that extends that those teachers who have more experience cannot apply for these jobs? Well, there's a couple of issues in, in relation to that. The scheme is already out there. Uh, I accept certainly that there are very vibrant young teachers who are out there who fall outside the scheme. But first of all, the scheme is actually designed to reprofile the workforce. Now, if we have a situation uh, that you simply lift the, uh, the requirements of where, where that is, where then do you set the requirements? You're left with one of two situations. Either you make it completely open-ended, in which case, in theory, you could have a teacher who is qualified for 30 or 35 years, possibly even replacing somebody who's less experienced or younger. I I'm not quite sure how that reprofiles the uh, how that reprofiles the workforce. Or alternatively, you draw an arbitrary line elsewhere, and again, you'll have people qualifying and people who aren't. But it is also the case that uh, to qualify for this, and indeed to qualify for funding for this, it was through the Public Sector Transformation Fund, which requires 
that the, the economic projections of what this will save schools in the school budget had to at least match what was being invested from the initial amount. Now, the reality is that if a business case was put forward for it to be entirely open-ended, the Department would not qualify for that public sector transformation fund, in which case the Department, from very tight resources at, at present, would simply have to fund that itself, and that is not something which is fundable at present. It is a requirement of, of that to be able to achieve that. Now, I can understand a degree of frustration for that. Now, I should also indicate that in terms of the scheme, it was something that was suggested by the teacher unions. I know the teacher unions and myself are not always on the same page, uh, but in this particular aspect, uh, we, we would be. And every single teacher union, whenever I met with them um, prior to this being launched, supported this scheme, supported the, the fact that it was there uh, on that basis on it. And the reality is the only, without having a cap, the scheme wouldn't be doable and no one no one who's a newly qualified teacher or early qualified teacher would be able to avail of this. I remind the Minister of the two-minute rule. Can I call Mr Barry McElduff? I would uh, empathise to some degree with the point being made about uh, those who are qualified longer needing to secure posts, and I would encourage the Minister to look creatively at that if he can in the future. But can I ask the Minister if there is any possibility of introducing a scheme or exploring a scheme which might refresh the principal workforce, head teacher workforce in our schools? Well, I understand what the member, in terms of, first of all, stretching the scheme, I, I was mindful of that, uh, which was why, and I appreciate again for the similar motivation, the previous minister had mooted a scheme. Uh, the previous scheme was mooted was a bit more restricted. I was able to stretch it effectively from effectively three years to five years. Um, but that was the limit to which it could be stretched while effectively qualifying in terms of the, the funding situation. The point, I suppose, as regards uh, the issue, particularly of head teachers, um, is that you're essentially the scheme is designed to have a like-for-like -like replacement. And whereas um, you can have a senior teacher who's been there for some time, who can then fit along the, the, the scale, if you like, with a replacement, if a maths teacher or history teacher, for instance, or a P6 teacher decides to retire, there's nothing effectively to stop a, a very new or recently qualified teacher to take their place. I don't think it's realistic to say um, that uh, you could simply take out a school principal and replace someone on that basis on the like for like replacement in relation to that. If, however, there are any schemes which people propose in the future, I'll always be happy to uh, examine those. But we're not necessarily, when we're talking about school principals, we're not talking about like for like um, within that, that system. Oh, Mr. Roy Beck. Mr. Speaker, I understand that in June 2015, only a third of newly qualified teachers gained employment after one year, uh, and uh, all will have incurred significant student debt. Can the Minister provide an outcome of any consideration as to whether he should alter the number of places for teacher training at our universities in Northern Ireland, rather than having to introduce one-off schemes which are not sustainable in the long term? Well, I don't necessarily, this is a pilot scheme, so it is something that can be sustainable. We should also remember that in terms of changes, there's about 750 vacancies that have become available each year. So there is some degree of throughput. And the, the indication, first of all, if we were to make changes to the overall intake in terms of teachers, uh, I think the issue in terms of training, um, I suppose there's a couple of issues in relation to that. You always then leave yourself open to the, the situation whereby if there's a further restriction in the numbers here, the people simply qualify and then try and come back, in which case you still are left with a different problem on that basis on it. It's also the case that even if we were to take, if there was a decision taken today to reduce dramatically the number of teachers getting trained, um, for that to have any particular impact on the workforce, you're talking at least four or five years down the line. And the reality is that you need to take action, uh, and this is why we, we've why the department and myself have supported the investing in teacher workforce, which, which tries to make some degree of impact uh, on the current bit. Now, there is a wider issue which I suppose the Assembly would have to deal with if we were looking at a dramatic reduction in terms of the number of, of teachers being trained. In that, I think Stromulus and St Mary's would not be both sustainable on that basis. Now, if we could get a degree of consensus around how we dealt with it, I know uh, that has been looked at in the past. Uh, it would be something which you would need to get a degree of consensus around uh, a, diff a completely different system because I think from an economies of scale point of view, you couldn't simply reduce the numbers there and both those institutions be sustainable. 
call Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The programme for, uh, for International Student Assessment 2015 has identified a gap of over two school years' attainment between the 25% most advantaged and 25% most disadvantaged 15-year-olds in Northern Ireland. Does the Minister not, therefore, accept that this is further evidence of the need for fundamental educational reform, including immediate action to address that oversupply of teachers? Well, good opportunity, I think, to shoehorn in the last bit about teacher education into a, a wider question on PISA, so I admire the member. I mean, the PISA figures basically show that uh, we are, again, slightly above average in terms of OEDC uh, figures. The PISA tests um, do not, are not as compatible with the Northern Ireland curriculum to the extent that, for instance, the TIMS uh, tests. And last week we saw a situation where, uh, because in terms of the, uh, the learning issues and indeed the way the curriculum is established, you're not comparing like with like on that basis. We did have a situation also that in terms of um, the overall situation, it was interesting that in terms of some of the figures from PISA, it gave indications that the gaps between those who are achieving the most and those who are achieving the least had actually narrowed considerably, and we were actually one of the best OEDC countries in terms of getting results, if you like, across the board uh, on, that, on that basis. Clearly, I think there are a range of issues which need a, a level of reform within education. I'm trying to pr progress those. So it's not simply a question, if you like, of, of standing still on that basis. And I know there's been a number of the issues which I know the member has discussed and indeed have been subject to this, this House. You know, it does suggest that while there has been a level of success within education within Northern Ireland, indeed we have, I think, to uh, effectively paraphrase what was said in the inspector's report, we have much to be proud of within uh, our results. There are other areas which I think we need to improve on, and that's why I think there is a need for overall levels of, of reform within education. Call Mr William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank the member for his question. As I'm sure you're aware, uh, in, the, in 2015, the Executive commissioned the development of an e-safety strategy, an action plan for Northern Ireland. This was a recognition uh, of the rising concerns of parents, carers, professionals, and broader society for the safety of children and young people uh, when using the internet and encouraging with, or to engaging with social media. Uh, my department is represented on the Strategy uh, Cross-Departmental Project Board and has contributed throughout the drafting process to ensure that the strategy includes as an aim the embedding of, the, of a culture of e-safety within schools and other educational settings. It's intended that the draft strategy will issue for public consultation early in the new year. Alongside the contribution of the draft strategy, my department has also issued guidance to schools on a number of occasions to provide the entire school community with advice on e-safety and how to use electronic devices safely. This guidance is available from the departmental website and includes links to other organisations providing specialist information and advice on this subject. Board of Governors have a statutory duty to safeguard and promote the welfare of pupils, and fulfilling this, this duty uh, schools are required to have in place an e-safety policy. Schools have been provided with guidance on what should be included in that e-safety policy and further updated guidance is scheduled to be issued in the near future. There is also a number of courses and resources aimed at specifically at Key Stage 2 to Key Stage 4 pupils dealing with various aspects of safety. Well, Mr Irwin for supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for his response? Uh, in effect, what will uh, an e-safety strategy mean for schools? Well, the vision, I think, of the, of the strategy um, is that all children and young people to have the best use of the educational, social and economic uh, benefits of online world while staying safe from potential harm online. Subject to executive approval, the draft strategy will be issued for public consultation early in the new year. Now, there are specific aims that, within the strategy which are applicable to schools, which include developing a consistent approach to e-safety in schools through strong departmental direction and technical provision, education of our young people and children on those and those who work with them, uh, develop a consistent approach to e-safety messages for children, young people, parents, uh, carers and practitioners, embedding a culture of e-safety within schools, colleges, youth services and organisations, and to skill up practitioners who work with children, young people and families. Now, it's not simply the question then of the creation of a strategy, but once agreed, the delivery of the strategy, I think, will be implemented by a three-year delivery plan. Call Mrs. Sandra Overend. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that update. Although I'm sure the Minister maybe shares my frustration that four years after such a strategy was, was uh, I agreed, that we're still waiting on a consultation to come out next year. I thought that was to happen um, around the time of the election. Um, so, but I wonder, does the Minister, uh, will the Minister ensure that such a strategy is live? Because technology changes uh, consistently, and we need to make sure that such a strategy keeps up to date. Look, I mean, as I said, the strategy itself will be due to launch in the early new year. It is undoubtedly, and I think for all of us, we take a step back and see at the speed with which technology is changing. And indeed, some of us, if, if we can all think back as far that way to our own school days, uh, will know sort of um, the difficulties. I, I appreciate there may be some in the house that would be a shorter journey than, than others. Um, but from that point of view, yes, no, I think we've got to realise that indeed what was relevant two years ago, three years ago, is changing now. So I think we've got to ensure that whenever we have a strategy, in it, and that's why I think that it's not just the creation of a strategy, but an overall implementation plan is critical, that we have something which is live and has a level of flexibility within it that can ensure that whatever changes there are in technology or changes in terms of a broader cultural change, because sometimes it's, it's less the direct technology and it's more the way that it's adapted, the way it is used, that we can have that flexibility so that, that things can respond fairly quickly to the um, you know, to the changing environment in that regard. So I think that is a critical issue. Call Ms. Kiva Archibald. Um, can I ask the Minister to outline the extent of cyberbullying and other forms of bullying um, that are affecting our children and young people at the health? Well, in terms of cyberbullying and other forms of bullying, um, we obviously, towards the end of the last mandate, passed the anti bullying legislation. Part of that will be then, as it's implemented by schools, to not simply record the bullying but also then to ensure that effectively what the methodology, what the cause of, of that is. Uh, from that point of view, and this was something I think as, at that stage I was chair of the, the committee, that we kind of wrestled with as to how best that could be um, implemented. And one of the things, I suppose, was to try to ensure that there was an accurate capture of all that information without running the risk of schools effectively being a form of league tables to, to say, you know, where was the greatest bullying, where, where wasn't. Uh, because there was a danger, therefore, either of stigmatising schools or indeed a danger that schools would not take bullying seriously enough and effectively try and dismiss that. Now, the, that bill passed in terms of royal assent um, on the 12th of May this year, and it obviously recognises cyberbullying as one of the, the key aspects of that. It is a complex legal issue because I think the other factor as well is we've got to look in terms of cyberbullying, and this again was one of the areas that there was a difficulty in trying to, to differentiate. Uh, the remit clearly of schools, and there is a, there is a provision within that for, for policies to be developed by boards of governors, but then also trying to capture where the cyberbullying is happening out with the school, where it is happening in weekends, where it's happening, say, during the summer holidays, is something that's very difficult to capture as well. That's why I think in terms of the safeguarding board, it's not just a question for the Department of Education, but we've been trying to work in conjunction with other government departments, because the evil that is there, and we've seen in some extreme cases, uh, not just the damaging effect it can have on people's lives, but actually, particularly for young people, some who've been driven to suicide by cyberbullying or bullying, is something that's pernicious, and we need to take every possible step that we can to uh, obliterate it from our society. Call Ms. Callie Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'd just like to commend the, the Minister. Tonight, I'm actually attending a social media um, workshop for parents, actually with the PSNI at Strangford Integrated College. So it's very timely this question has come forward. But could I ask the Minister, given that many social media organisations have offices on the island of Ireland, how is he involving them in his programme? Again, that's part of the, the safeguarding board. I think there'll need to be liaison going back and forward to those organisations. Now, again, Part of the issue is to want where we can apply pressure on some of the social media organisations and it's about trying to find the root of where they, the issue is because again part of the problems if you like with and we've seen this in a general sense with a lot of internet problems that you're talking about something which is so multinational in its, in its nature that makes it a lot more difficult directly to control. I suppose it's why we need to have a, a greater level of agility in our own minds as to what actions that, that uh, we can take because again the sort of the stereotype, which still happens, but that many of us sort of remember potentially from a number of years ago, where it was, you know, here is the uh, particular one child sort of hanging outside the school gates waiting for the other child to emerge to then physically assault them or threaten them. It has moved well beyond that, and I think that we, we need to actually ensure that, that as I said, with the flexibility of the approach 
And indeed, I think it's important that we see what links can be built with some of those organisations to try and control that. And I think there has been some steps that have been taken, but I think with a lot of the social media um, organs, they've been probably a little bit slow at times to react. Hopefully, there's a little bit of catch-up happening with that now. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to topical questions. I call Mr Jerry Mullen. Uh, could I ask the Minister to provide an update uh, on the teachers' pay dispute and resulting strike uh, action that, that followed it? Uh, because I'm sure the Minister, uh, just like me, you have concerns that we are now approaching a, a crisis stage in the education system. Well, situation, I, I thank the question for the member for the Right Honourable Constituency of NASUWT. Um, and can I say within that, uh, look, it is made abundantly clear there has been a call that has, that has gone out from the managing authorities to try and sit down and see where we can provide long-term solutions within this. The reality is within the 2015-16, 2016-17 budget, there isn't the money to pay there. And indeed, at times, there has been some issues raised in relation to this in terms of parity. But yet, when an offer was made by management side, which was greater than parity, the teacher unions said no to it. You know, there is a situation in which I think within the current constraints, I think what was and has been put in place for 15, 16, 16, 17 was ultimately within the current constraints a fair offer in that regard. I appreciate that not be one that everyone will agree with, but the important thing is actually that people try and move on from this position. Let's see a situation. I mean, it's been mentioned, it's been made. And I know. Um, Mr McCann raised it, I think, on a previous uh, occasion that he would very much be on the barricades with the, uh, the teachers. Wherever barricades were erected, I think Mr McCann would be there. Um, but let's remember that in terms of this direct issue, there has been an issues around, uh, if you like, industrial dispute with teachers arising since 2011 onwards. Now, that is not directly related to pay. I think the other issue in relation to that is that if we're sitting down, let's see what we can do across the board. As I mentioned earlier, and I think this is where there's a degree of common interest in that regard, if one of the arguments that is used is around conditions of what pressures are put in terms of additional paperwork, in terms of additional requirements on that basis, that's something I think I would be keen to see discussed between management and the trade unions as well. Because the more bureaucracy that we can lift out of the system, where it's, particularly where it's unnecessary on that, on that grounds, I think we should be exploring that as well. So I would urge the unions to actually take up the offer of sitting down with the management team to look where we can get from 2017 beyond. I call Mr Mullen for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, and just uh, regardless of what the Minister may think, I don't speak for the, uh, the NAS UWT. I represent the children. And uh, could I ask the Minister then to maybe enlighten me as to what he has, has he engaged with the finance ministers uh, or any other executive colleagues um, concerning the future of teachers' pay? The position in terms of the two-year pay deal was signed off by the Department of Finance in terms of an overall package. Let us remember as well that in terms of the package, there were increments built in in both 15, 16 and 16, 17. Now, when you compare those, for instance, with what happens across the water, automatic increments were abolished in 2013. Uh, so, you know, again, if we're having a situation, if you're comparing, you've got to compare like with like. The reality is, as was indicated, I think, within the monitoring round, and indeed it is about a wider context of that, there isn't any additional money, there isn't any money in budget, and so I think there's a certain reality needs to be faced up to in, in connection with that. And given where school budgets are at present, the reality is that if you inject additional pay costs beyond what is there at present, I think it is only likely to lead to a greater level of redundancies within staff. And I've also got to be careful of teachers' jobs to try to protect those as well. And what I would say is my key concern is actually about protecting that school budget, particularly for the children. Call Ms. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In light of the recent publication of the Employees for Childcare Cost of Childcare Survey Results 2016, can the Minister outline how he is going to address the increasing cost of childcare? Well, there's a childcare strategy that's being prepared for the executive. We need to see how that can be best implemented. There has been, I think, an acceptance of level of support, and I want to see that that is something that has increased. But we will need to ensure that what we're getting is something that is financially viable in, in current uh, circumstances. I'm happy to engage, indeed have engaged at times with various childcare organisations to see how we can best take this forward. They were, I think, fairly actively involved in the design work and, indeed, discussions around uh, the development of that childcare strategy. I think that will be coming fairly soon to the executive. 
call Mrs. Dobson for her supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think a good starting point in this process would be to finally publish the child care strategy. Since May, um, Minister, you've repeatedly stated in your um, written questions that you will be presenting the child care strategy to the executive in the, in the coming months, and not much clear today either in your answer. So, can you confirm exactly when or in what month that will be? I'm not in a position to give an exact date, and obviously my duty will be to get it on the executive schedule, have it debated by the executive, and then hopefully passed in that, in that regard. And from that point of view, while I appreciate that I am uh, responsible directly to the House, I'm also directly responsible in terms of first instance to be able to provide papers directly to the executive. I hope that that will be reasonably soon. It is also the case then, depending upon what is agreed with that, we will have to look at what the implementation of that will be as well. Call Mr. William Irwin. Topical question. Topical question. Yes. Okay. Can the minister give us an update on the Battlefields Project? Well, the Battlefields Project was one that was launched uh, was launched today uh, by myself and Minister, minister Given. The Battlefields Project has been something which has been available in other parts of the United Kingdom, uh, but was not embraced. It's occasionally happened with the odds to doing things off their own bat up until now. This will actually be available. It's something that's jointly funded by both my department and that of the Department of Communities. It will be available from uh, the summer of 2017, essentially for year 10 students that will be a representative of every school. And they, can I say, in terms of particularly if we're looking at the issue of the contribution and the sacrifice that was made on the First World War battlefield, that was something which happened across the community. Sometimes people tend to forget that, tend to pigeonhole this in some shape or form. And as such, the, uh, the offer to any school will be to all post-primary schools. No one's obliged to take it, but I would certainly encourage schools from across the community to take advantage of this and to, to if you like, help make history real, not just from the syllabus, but actually to highlight, if you like, some of the great sacrifices that were made to allow us all the freedom that we have today. Well, Mr. Irwin, for supplementary. Thank you. And can I thank the Minister for, uh, for his response? Uh, can the minister give us any idea to the longevity of the, the in future years for the project? Well, you know, I would see that being something that is mainstream. The initial announcement in terms of the broad CSI period would be for the next three years, but I don't see any cap in terms of time within that. Again, within the confines of overall budget, it's a relatively small amount uh, of money compared to maybe some other uh, costs that, that lie within the department or others. So I would hope that this would be something that will gain traction. It has been something which has been very successful in other parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, and again, I think particularly there's a resonance as we've moved towards some of the most historic anniversaries. Uh, obviously, this year marked uh, the 100th anniversary of the Somme. Looking ahead, for instance, next year, the Passchendaele will be 100 years. The year after that will be the, will be the end of the First World War. So there, are, there is, a, I think, an important time uh, for that opportunity to be given. And that opportunity is available and indeed, letters will be going out to every post-primary school in Northern Ireland. Call Mr. Richie McPhillips. I thank the Minister for his answer so far. With regard to voluntary youth clubs in Northern Ireland and their governance, can the Minister outline what structures are in place for accountability in areas such as child protection and financial management? And can he outline who in his department has the responsibility to carry out this work? Well, in terms of the details of the particular person, I'd be happy to write out to the member in relation to that. I don't simply have a name off the top of my, my head in that regard. Uh, what I would indicate that I would pay tribute, I think, to a lot of the work that is happening through voluntary youth organisations. Obviously, in terms of child protection, uh, there are uh, access and eye checks to be done where people are actually moving, and that's something which lies directly outside my department. And I know at times there can sometimes be a little bit of frustration over the length of time that that takes. Uh, I think from that point of view, though, I think it is important that we do pay tribute to all the good work that is happening in whatever organisation uh, in terms of voluntary youth work that has been provided, because they in many ways fill the gap uh, from what is there from a statutory sector, and I think people give very willingly of their time to be able to provide that service. Mr McPhillip, first supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer. Can the Minister outline whether he is confident that the current arrangements in place, especially those involving child protection issues, are sufficient in terms of operation of these voluntary youth clubs? Well, broadly speaking, I think I'm content. However, if the member has any particular concerns in relation to that, that he's keen to the department to probe, I'm very happy to um, uh, 
receive those in the, on that basis, um, and I'll be happy to respond to whatever the, the member raises. But you know, I, I think, generally speaking, things have, have worked fairly well uh, on, on that basis. We do have secure checks in place on it. Nothing, I think, in life can ever be 100% watertight, and that's always the danger that we've got to try and uh, avoid where, where possible. Uh, but I have a general level of contentment. But I'll be happy to, if the member has specific concerns, to be able to, if he uh, writes to me, we'll be able to look into those for him. Call Mr. Alan Chambers. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, can the Minister outline the reasons why the estimated cost of the Struel Shared Education Campus in OMA has gone up by nearly £20 million within a matter of months? Well, the short answer is it hasn't, and that's, that's where I think, again, there's been a number of figures that have been bandied about in terms of this. Uh, the issue is that it's whether you count costs as being, if you like, the, the straight figure that is, would be directly a cost, but most um, major capital projects will have what's called an, optimum, an optimism bias that has to be added in in terms of the, the cost. And so, for example, the figure that was quoted, which I think was referenced to about 140 million, was 137 million without optimism bias, which is effectively to ensure that some degree of protection for whatever contingencies that are there. Uh, the figure when optimism bias is added in is 159 million. So it's actually, if you like, which figure you're looking at. But the figure from that point of view in the last couple of months hasn't, hasn't changed. There has been alterations since the uh, original position uh, of a number of years ago of an initial estimate, and that's been through a range of some additional pressures that are there. For example, there was a particular issue in terms of, OMA, in terms of road transport that, that had to be covered. But the figures haven't changed in the last couple of months. Mr. Chambers, for supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, certainly, Minister, the figures that I'm looking at are from your own department. But if the project is not going to be completed until September 2020, as indicated by yourself in answers to written questions, do we have any reason to believe that the cost of the project will not continue to spiral out of control over the course of the next three and a half years? Sorry, with respect, they're not spiraling out of, out of the control. If you're, you've, if you're comparing figures, you've got to compare like with like. And as I indicated, the figure, if you don't put an optimism bias into it, is 137. Without it, it's 159. That has been the position for the last number of months uh, on that basis. You know. But from that point of view, in terms of being able to, uh, you know, it's a bit like uh, if I was buying something in the member's shop with the add VAT onto it, or you don't add VAT onto it, it's a different price. Indeed, what the member would get through his pocket would be very different from what the actual price on the shelf is. So it's a question of comparing like with like. You know, I'm not in a position, I suppose, from that point of view, to be able to knock off prices to provide a, uh, a cheaper alternative. And can I commend anybody in the Groomsport area to uh, Mr. Chambers' shop, who provides a very good, very good service. You, know, you, won't get, uh, you won't get sort of stuff given away like Santa's Grotto, but nevertheless, uh, the member will provide a good service on that, on that basis. The reality is the amount hasn't changed on that basis. But with any capital project, there is always likely to be some level of fluctuation. Before I call Mr McCann, he may not get a supplementary. Mr McCann. Okay, the Minister, uh, oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the Minister will be aware and is referred to uh, the recent strike uh, by members of the NASUWT, and he has taken a rather obdurate position in relation to it. So, given that and given the fact that the other three teachers' unions are presently balloting for strike action, would you agree with me that the best strategy teachers might uh, adopt in order to shift the minister from his present obdurate position would be for all four unions to strike together? No, I wouldn't. I mean, I have to say, I'm not going to take a, a lecture from the member in being obdurate, who I suspect hasn't changed his position in about the last half century <laughs> in that regard. No, I think what, what needs to happen is that. What's that? Well, yes, and to be fair, whatever, whatever other criticism um, I would make, a bit like sort of Castro, you've been consistent in your position really for the last half century. I would say I'm not going to criticise the member for inconsistency on that basis. But I think as maybe a previous member alluded to, my main concern is that of the, the children on that basis. And to encourage, I think it's highly irresponsible of the member to essentially encourage people to go out on strike, particularly in circumstances which there isn't additional money that is there. It's not a question of obduracy. It is a question of there is not money within the budget to be able to provide for this. And so the member is, is somewhat trailblazing with the red flag uh, down the, the path of path of no return in relation to this because there will not be additional money and there cannot be additional money for that period. What I would encourage is that there has been a long-term uh, there have been long-term issues in relation to the teaching workforce 
I believe that there can be constructive dialogue around those, and it is not about how we look backwards, whether it is to storming the Winter Palace or, uh, if you like, sort of the, the jungles of Havana, but rather looking forward to where we can actually move in the future from 2017 onwards. And that is actually the encouragement I would give, rather than taking, I think, what is quite an irresponsible attitude of encouraging strike action to actually deprive our children of, of their education. Members, time is up. That concludes. Point of order, Mr. Alistair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, during question time, the Economy Minister lavishly said that I had written to him pleading for a constituent to be included in the RHI scheme. Uh, in view of that distortion, could I correct the record that in September and in October of this year, I wrote on behalf of two separate constituents who had applied to the scheme back in February and had heard nothing, and I did what any other constituency member would have done. I wrote and asked, why have these people not heard about their applications? You have placed your concerns on the record. Uh, no doubt that the Minister will be aware of your concerns, Mr Ellister. That concludes question time. I invite members to take their ease while we change the top tables.